She got her degree from Willamette University in Oregon, and she got a BA in Religious Studies and Biology. Uh, she spent this last year with a new AmeriCorps program called Civic Park, which works with local governments to prepare for climate change. Uh, during this year, she focused on climate change education and developing curriculum. Um, she's currently working with the City of Arcata's Environmental Services Department on climate change related tasks. So, what her talk is going to be tonight is on climate change. Hopefully, what we can do about it and not be despair about it. So, hopefully, we'll get things together any minute now. Okay, thank you all for coming out. I'm happy to see some new people out here to discuss this important topic of communicating climate change. And I think there was already an introduction done. I was in the back, so um, I didn't hear it. But hopefully you guys have a little background on me. But um, I'm going to be talking about how we can relate to others about around climate change, communicate this important issue. And um, if you guys read the summary of my talk, I said that a lot of people are aware that climate change is happening and it's an important issue. But this isn't to say that there's no deniers, it's just to say that there's a lot less deniers than you'd imagine given the state of kind of public and action we see around climate change. And what this would make one think is that either people are, one, not aware of climate change, two, apathetic about the issue of climate change, or three, deniers. And so what we see in academic circles to try to combat this issue of lack of public engagement as we see academics try to communicate the science over and over again to try to combat this problem by inundating the public with knowledge. And we see that um, this really hasn't solved the problem of public, lack of public engagement, with 97% of the world's scientists saying that climate change is happening, it's real, and it's man-made. We still don't see a lot of action in the public sphere around climate change. So, what have I learned this year with my work with Civic Spark, which I think Richard introduced, um, was that it's really a lot less about people understanding the science around climate change, if that's important, but it's more about us understanding the psychology behind how people relate to climate change. And it's really about, as the slide shows, people. It's about being able to communicate with people and relate to people. So, it's a really exciting time for um, this field communicating around climate change because there's a lot of new research out there. There's a plethora of research out there around climate change psychology and how to communicate around climate change. And I hope that this talk just does a little um, uh, introduction to helping people understand how to relate to others around climate change. And there's a lot of resources. I have a resource list that I can provide, kind of get the printer working <laughs> today, but I can send out an email, technical difficulties the theme tonight. Um, so um, what we see in the states is this political paradox around climate change. We see that we have a majority of Democrats, independents, and liberal and moderate Republicans who want climate action and are more likely to vote for a presidential candidate who supports climate action. We only have um, a minority of conservative Republicans who are opposed to climate change or climate action, and this is uh, studies done from Yale University that show this, so this might be surprising to some of you. But what we also see is that climate is a low policy priority, and we also have an entire wing of the U.S. government who is controlled by a party whose leaders deny the scientific consensus on human-caused climate change. This is a quote from Pierre Espen Stokness, who is a psychologist and economist, and he says, the challenge now is how to convert the felt concern into prioritizing the climate issue relative to other issues. Roughly one or two in ten need to shift into giving greater priority to ambitious climate policies. That would create a voter majority in favor of a great, great swerve. And so he's the, he's the author of a book that I have out front, I think someone might have picked up, called What We Think About When We Try Not to Think About Global Warming Towards a New Psychology of Climate Action. And I'd like to suggest that the reason we don't see mass public engagement is that there's a lot of psychological barriers to action. 
And through this talk, I'd like to shed light on what some of those barriers are so that we can learn communication strategies that will empower people to action. And with that, we can create a public movement around climate change that demands bold political action. So before I go delve too deeply into my talk, I want to give credit to some of the groups that I'm borrowing information from. A lot of this information comes from Climate Access, which is a group or a network of climate um, and sustainability professionals. They have 2,000 members and work across 57 countries. Karen Pike is the director who I had the privilege of attending a two-day workshop with last year with my work. And, um, they really focus on cutting edge research and proven strategies for engaging people towards political action around climate change. So a lot of this research comes out of the workshop, the talk that I attended with Kara Pike. But I've also done a lot of my own research around the psychology of climate change and want to give credit as well to Rosemary Randall. And she's the director of Cambridge Carbon Footprint, which is a registered charity that focuses on helping people lower their carbon footprint and um, bring social awareness to the issue of climate change. I split this lecture into two parts. The first part I'm going to talk, go into influences that affect our relationship to climate change and how willing we are to respond to the issue and barriers that come up around communicating with climate change with these influences. So we have values and worldviews, emotions, efficacy, sense of place, and risk response. And then the second part of the lecture, I'm going to go into some strategies that we can use to communicate with people around all of these influences and how we can make these barriers actually become opportunities for communicating with people. The first influence that I'm going to touch on is values and worldviews. So this is, um, this is really important because our worldview greatly impacts how we respond to risk and new information. So our worldview will either motivate us to action or it can also create barriers to new action. And I want to highlight the study called Regreen, the Ecological Roadmap, which was done by a group called American Environics and Lake Research Partners and produced by Earth Justice. They did research on American social values and environmental engagement with the idea that they want to discover why there's a disconnection between ecological concern and action. And what they had discovered was that in a lot of demographic research, they don't provide insight into people's worldviews, which is hugely problematic when we're looking at how people relate to climate change, because worldviews really influence how someone relates to um, this issue. They did extensive research on how the environment fits into broader worldviews of the American public, and they actually came up with 10 distinct uh, worldviews on the environment. And so with the extreme on one side being the greenest Americans, who believe that everything's interconnected and see how our daily actions affect the environment, to the ungreens on the other side, who believe that environmental degradation and pollution are inevitable for the prosperity and our economy. So, and then you have everything in between those two extremes. So my point here is that we're not all going to respond to the messaging of climate change the same. A one-size-fits-all technique for trying to talk to people around climate change won't work because we're all coming from different backgrounds. And it's found people are very tribal. We uh, respond a lot better to new information when we think it's coming from someone within our own social group than from someone outside of our social group. So it's really important to understand this. Um, when it comes to communicating climate change. This is a study that plays off of that same idea, and it's called The Six Americas. It was a study done by Yale University and George Mason University. The idea here was to determine Americans' climate change beliefs and attitudes, and this chart outlines the level of engagement they saw with people in America around climate change. This was the news information that you get from October 2014. We see the alarmed group are the group that have the highest belief in climate change and are most concerned and most motivated. So with 13%, they're convinced climate change is happening, human-caused and serious and urgent threat. The concerned group, which is the biggest group, 31%, 
believe it's a serious problem, support national response, but are less personally involved. The cautious group believe it's a problem, not, but not an urgent problem, and are unsure if it was human caused. Disengaged group don't know much about climate change and don't think much about it. And the doubtful group aren't sure if climate change is real or not, but think if it is, that it's a natural and distant threat. And the dismissive group would be the deniers, but if you think of when you think of deniers, they believe it's not happening and it's a hoax. And so, um, but that's only 13% of the population. So the take home message here is to, that's really important for us to understand the influence of one's worldview because it really affects how one is going to respond to the threat of climate change. The next influence and barrier that I wanted to get into was emotions. Um, emotions are not secondary in our role for how we respond to risk. They actually fill a central role for determining how people process information and respond to risk. Researchers have shown that emotional understanding of knowledge, people's feelings, actually have a greater influence on behavior than abstract or technical knowledge. So relating to someone's emotions around climate change is going to be more uh, strongly influence them than relating to just technical, maybe scientific knowledge around climate change. As the slide says, emotions drive people, people drive change, and this is important because of how climate change is typically communicated. What we typically see with climate change communication is, is oftentimes with a focus on science and emphasis on what, um, what we're going to lose, the normity of the problem, and it often can feel apocalyptic, which these strategies often play on fear, guilt, and shame. It's important to be realistic about the severity of the problem. It's a huge problem, and there is a lot of risk loss, but playing on the feeling of fear causes people to shut down and makes them feel fatalistic with the sense that there's no hope and the problem is too big to do anything about. Because fear is a disempowering emotion. Some authors actually think that climate change, skepticism, and resistance to behavior change is a partially a result from a desire to avoid negative emotions. So this slide shows that, that um, fatalism can lead to denial and inaction, and that's because of this message of fear that we get a lot that causes people to shut down and not want to relate to climate change. Another issue or barrier we see around climate change and emotions is the way that it's communicated in the media. And this comes from Rosemary Randall's work, who I um, presented in the beginning. She wrote an um, essay called Two Parallel Parallels, Loss and Solutions with Climate Change. And she says there's an issue with how climate change is presented because it's presented with a narrative of loss and a narrative of solutions, and they're disjunct and they don't mesh. So she says that in the narrative of loss, we get the doom and gloom, the apocalyptic, the dramatic, drastic, no way out story. And in the solution story, we completely skip over the loss. So we just focus on solutions as if there will be no loss at all. And that's not realistic to what the nature of climate change is. There will inevitably be loss, be it species loss, or loss of the way we're used to living our life. Another issue we see with the solution narrative is that the solutions often don't match the severity of the loss. So we're told um, this loss and this apocalyptic vision, and then we're told that you just need to go home and change your light bulbs, or recycle, or drive less, and then it just causes people to dissociate because it doesn't match up and it doesn't make sense. Where's that from? The the, well, like, yeah, I, I don't know. I found it online. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> um, oh, actually. Um, so this is a quote from Rosemary Randall that I liked to summarize this parallel narrative was that what we see with the treatment of loss and climate change is a process where fear of loss leads to it being split off and projected into the future. The present continues to feel safe at the expense of the future being terrifying. So basically she's saying that with our inability to process and acknowledge that there will be loss even with solutions, we put off dealing with um, solutions and trying to work towards impacts and then we just make more loss in the future for ourselves. So because of this, she says that it's really important for us to acknowledge our grief around climate change and the state of the world right now. Um, 
And this really resonates with me because I think that I personally feel um, a sadness within myself at the state of the world and thinking of species loss and disruption and um, what's going on with the world. And I think that many of us, maybe subconsciously or consciously, have those feelings, but we don't have any way to relate to them because there's no support structure in our society. And so that's what Rosemary Randall is suggesting, is that because we're part of the planet, that the destruction of the state of the planet actually does affect all of us individually and personally as well. And so she really advocates for acknowledging our loss and the grief we feel for the state of the planet right now. And so she thinks this is really important. It says, when loss remains unspoken, neither grief nor, nor work through, then change and adjustment cannot follow. So she says, if loss is denied, resentment and bitterness can occur and will be stuck in um, a place of being unable to work through this reality and will but whenever we look at the um, reality of climate change, we'll feel anxiety, which then leads to apathy and then inaction. So I just thought these photos were powerful because I think that there is a time and a place where it's appropriate to mourn, to work through those feelings of loss, and this is what these photos showed to me. And to go off of that more, Rosemary Randall says that we all have a capacity to tolerate and integrate the knowledge of situations of others as both good and bad, and it's a sign of a healthy psyche, and that we need to understand solutions of climate change, also including loss. So there will be loss in order to work towards solutions, but that's okay, and that's part of life. There's always good and bad, and we need to be able to sit with both in order to come up with real solutions. But then a barrier to this is that it's really hard for people to be able to work through their feelings of loss and grief associated with climate change and disruption of the planet because it's not something that's socially acceptable. It's something that we're told if we feel lost, we should feel it behind closed doors for a limited amount of time and not express it really with others. And so this is a barrier when it comes to relating around emotions with climate change and working through that loss. Rosemary Randall says that we need a more sophisticated understanding of the process of loss and mourning, one which allows people to restore public narratives that would help to release energy for holistic and lasting programs of change. So this is why we need to understand the process of loss, so that we can work through our emotions to come out with solutions on the other side, instead of being paralyzed due to anxiety. And she says this process is first accepting the reality of loss, which is where many of us are when it comes to climate change, and then working through the painful emotions from that adjusting to the new, which is important with climate change because the future with climate change will not be the same as the present or the past. It's going to be different. That's the reality of the situation. But in order to accept that, we have to be able to work through these feelings of loss or else we'll never be able to fully accept that and move on towards solutions, which is the reinvesting of emotional energy. And this is the hoped for result of mourning, that emotional energy will be freed up for living and ultimately creative solutions. She says that, Randall says that the cost of ignoring loss is high if we ignore this process. What we can see in ourselves and society is rejection and avoidance. And um, I can relate to this. I think a lot of people probably can. You just go home and you're tired and you turn on the television and zone out or addictive type behaviors. Or we can see manic activity, extreme shopping, or um, basically anything that doesn't give you time to think or feel or time to face what has happened or what is happening. Another cost of ignoring loss is idealization. So this kind of utopian vision of what the future will bring, which doesn't isn't realistic to the situation. Or what you can come up with is false solutions, which is um, when you haven't had the process of mourning and moving on from the loss, your emotional energy hasn't been able to be reinvested. Instead, you have kind of a group consciousness of idolizing and seeing the past as preferable. And she gives an example as the Save the Bee movement, which I'm sure many of you have heard of or seen, which we have a mass die-off of honeybees, and um, a lot of what this movement suggests as a solution is to plant bee-friendly flowers in your garden, or um, 
and that's important and these small step solutions are important but it's ignoring the underlying systematic issue which is our agricultural system and monocropping and pesticide use which is what is actually killing the bees so if we ignore our loss we could come up with false solutions that are more like band-aid solutions and don't address the underlying systematic changes that need to happen which are what the big changes are when it comes to climate change so I really liked this quote. I think it summarizes what I've been saying in this section. We need to grieve with the full range of emotion which that implies. Only then will we become able to remake our futures using all of our creativity, reason, feeling, and strength. So the, my take home message here is that emotions play a central role in how people process information and re respond to climate change. And unresolved loss and mourning has real and tangible effects in holding back progress or distracting us from difficult political action around the issue of climate change. Another influence or barrier we have is efficacy. And with efficacy, what we see, and this falls directly from um, the role of emotions, is that people feel very fatalistic. We believe that we don't have the ability to take action and impact the outcome of the situation. And this is because of many reasons I already mentioned, because of what the communication strategies are currently, which are um, not, um, which play on fear. And then also the message we're set about solutions and how they don't match up with the severity of the loss narrative. But another reason that people feel fatalistic is that we don't see leaders acting as drastically as the issue seems to demand. So fatalism can come from not seeing political action, and that's what this uh, little cartoon is about. The research concludes, we're destroying the earth, and then the government over here says, could you kindly rephrase that in equivocal, inaccurate, vague, self-serving, and roundabout terms so that we can understand? So um, that's kind of the feeling behind with efficacy and um, not seeing political action. We see that most voters favor preparedness as a preferred approach to dealing with climate change. More than half Americans think preparing for climate change will equal more jobs. 94% think pr preparation for climate change will be difficult though. So what we see is that people think we have solutions, but don't think we have the will as a society to make the change. And so this is kind of that, um, it's another cartoon about fatalism. It's the third piece of toast, and she says, it's God's will. Had the toast been destined to be edible, it would be so. So this is kind of what we see with around um, an action. It's just, it's too late, there's nothing to do. People feel fatalistic, so they stop trying before um, they even start. Another um, big influence we see with people around climate change is sense of place. And so a barrier we see with this is that people never think of climate change affecting them personally and their home personally. We always think of climate change affecting somewhere else in the world. You think of the poor people in India or Bangladesh, or, but we never really think it's going to affect us here in our community. It's the not me, not here, not now phenomenon. And this is a big barrier, but it's also a big opportunity because people really care about their sense of home and their sense of place, and so it's a good opportunity to engage people, which I'll talk about later. What we also see is when kids learn about climate change in schools, how they often learn about it is through learning about the poor polar bears in the Arctic or the melting glaciers. And that's important to learn about, but it also sends a message of disconnection because most kids have never actually seen a polar bear in real life, and it just doesn't connect to their life. and so. Um, this is hard because it, people just don't think it's actually going to affect them and it causes inaction again. Another um, influence we have and barrier is how people respond to risk. So people respond to risk with the value of certainty, which is we would rather address a small risk and reduce it to zero than reduce a big risk by a little. And this is really hard with climate change because um, there's a lot of uncertainties with climate change and variability. There's a lot of moving pieces and people's inclination is to focus on issues that have direct and obvious solutions. We're not always going to see solutions come to fruition with climate change in our lifetime. In fact, a lot of um, the solutions we need are more long-term solutions. And so this is hard for people to engage with because they don't 
it goes against their value of certainty and they don't want to engage because they're not gonna they're not guaranteed an outcome of a solution. So this, that concludes the first half of the lecture. Um, if you need a stretch break, I hear you do it now, I'm gonna get some water. Um, and then I'll talk more about the more uh, optimistic um, solutions to everything I just talked about. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to start the second half and I'm going to talk about the same issues or influences that I talked about in the beginning, but talk about strategies for combating the barriers and the solutions for um, relating with these values and worldviews, emotions, efficacy, sense of place, and risk response. So the first one, if you can remember, was values and worldviews which is a central component that affects how receptive people are to new information. And um, what we saw with the barrier was understanding identity and status. What we see is kind of a one-size-fits-all messaging around climate change. And what we really need is to meet people where they're at. Climate access says that they are, it's more, you're more successful if you engage with people, if you adopt different strategies according to the group that they are um, involved in. So, uh, as I mentioned before, the Six Americas study, Climate Access actually came up with some strategies for engaging each of these six groups. For the alarmed group, they suggested engaging tendency towards political activism. The concerned group, they suggested guiding and sparking their tendency for consumer activism. Cautious group, they suggested demonstrating current impacts in their community. For the disengaged group, they suggested convincing them that people, especially the lower class, are especially at risk with climate change. And the doubtful group, they suggested to actually talk about science and show that the vast majority of scientists are concerned and that it's real and human cause. And so this is a great example because the actual strategy that we see right now around communicating climate change is really geared towards the doubtful group. That's only 12% of the population. And all these other groups are gonna respond more um, successfully if you engage them with different strategies. And the dismissive group, they suggested to not uh, needlessly anger by being disrespectful of their views. So basically, you don't need to engage the dismissive group because you have all these other groups that you can engage. Hannah, could you say the cautious one again? I didn't yeah. quite get that one. Um, to demonstrate the current impacts for their community, so kind of place-based education. This is a framework that uh, was developed by Bob DePolt from the Resource Innovation Group, which is a nonprofit that focuses on innovative solutions for the complex socio-ecological challenges of our time. And so he created this framework for climate and sustainability leaders to try to assess where audiences are at in the process of shifting the mindset and behavior around climate change. So this is a tailored approach that's designed to move people from one stage to another. And the stages are supposed to follow each other, but that doesn't always happen linearly. So what we see with the disinterest group is this is the first stage where people aren't ready to change. They're unaware that climate change is happening or have not accepted it. The deliberation group are beginning to consider the issue of climate change and what it would mean to them personally. This doesn't mean they're ready to change. The design group um, have started to realize that the benefits of preparing for climate change will outweigh the costs and may be in ready for the preparation change, the um, planning, planning phase for action. The doing group are actively taking action to shift their behavior. And the defend group has incorporated new thinking and behaviors into their daily life, but maybe looking for new actions to partake in. And so if you're interested, you can see me after Climate Access actually came up with a really elaborate list of strategies to engage each of these audiences. Um, and so there's some really great resources out there for engaging audiences depending where they are in the stages. And so the whole point of the section talking about values and worldviews is to show how important it is to engage and talk to people with different viewpoints and social groups. What we need in a climate movement is diversity. We need, um, it's not going to work if we just think that engaging a small group of people that have the same worldview is going to come up with solutions. We need people outside of just extreme environmentalists. We need everyone involved or a lot of people involved. 
And so I wanted to just provide a couple strategies for engaging with someone that, or a group, an audience that might have a different ideology or worldview than yourself. And so the first suggestion is to not start with climate change. As you guys are all aware, in the US climate change has become a polarizing issue, which is unfortunate, but you don't have to start with climate change. You can get there. Um, there's a lot of issues. Climate change impacts everything. And um, you can pick something that your audience or the person you're talking to, you know, can connect with you on. Everyone cares about health. Everyone wants to be healthy, have clean water, clean air. So for example, health is a great way to connect with someone on climate change. This is just a chart that shows some of the effects on human health from climate change. And so this is just to give an example that you don't have to start with climate change. Another suggestion is to build on nonpartisan values. These are values that were researched by Climate Access that people from um, across political spectrums all relate to. Most people care about protection and safety, foresight, stewardship, fairness. So if you can frame your message around climate change on one of these values, you will probably be most, most likely be a lot more successful than just starting with climate change. What we saw in the barrier section around emotions, if you can remember, is that there's really a lack of understanding of the role of emotions and how people respond to climate change. Emotions are fundamental in our role for informing how people process information, and they're not, sec they're not secondary. What we see with our sexual communication strategies is playing on emotions that fuel fatalistic attitudes that lead to denial, depression, and inaction. So what we need to do as a strategy is to utilize emotions to empower people instead of disempower people. <coughs> and one way to do that, um, I believe, is to use art to connect to people's hearts. So science connects to people's minds, which is great, but we need in the movement to connect to people's hearts. And so art is a great way to do that, and it's also a great way to get the community involved past the scientific debate. This is an example of a project where they um, they take their, um, they put barnacles around the telephone poles in the city to demonstrate what sea level rise would look like within the city. So it really got people thinking and engaged around sea level rise in relation to climate change. Another strategy is to really be deliberate with your communication around climate change. So if you can, communicate with an ask. So instead of just communicating all of the issues and the risk and the loss around climate change, to also present solutions. And if you can, present an action to your audience. So for example, if you're communicating to a public audience about an issue in your community, if there's a petition, if there's an action that the audience can do and follow up with, that's a really great way to get the community involved so that you're utilizing emotions to empower and not just communicating the science with, uh, over and over again and um, falling into the trap of playing on people's fears. Another barrier that I talked about in the emotion section was that there's, we have no structure in society for honoring our loss and um, that climate change affects many of us very deeply on a personal level, but there's no structure in place in society for people to work through their grief both personally and interpersonally. And this is important because in order for us to be able to work through, to come up with solutions, we need to work through our grief to reinvest energy so that we're not trapped in denial. Um, and so strategy for this is to acknowledge our grief. And um, you can do that personally, but also through support groups. And this is a great example. Carbon Conversations is a group that um, advertises as a supportive group experience that helps people have their carbon footprint. And they deal with the difficulties of change by trying to connect with people's values, emotions, and identity. And it's based on the psychological understanding of how people change. And they really do put an emphasis and focus on helping people work through and acknowledge loss around climate change and also um, the, working through two examples of loss. So there's the loss of what we feel with the world of climate change and the disruption and loss of species and extinction on our planet, but then also working through choosing loss as in choosing a different lifestyle. So helping the participants choose to maybe drive less or 
um, eat less meat or examples like that. So they have to work through the loss of what they're feeling and grief towards the planet to be able to choose the loss of a different, um, living a different lifestyle. The groups usually are comprised of six to eight members and run by a trained facilitator. So this is a great example, Carbon Conversations. They've had a lot of successes with their um, group of helping people lower their carbon footprint and talk about the issue of climate change. Another um, barrier we see and with efficacy, as I talked about, is fatalism. So the feeling that it's hopeless, there's nothing we can do, that the problem is too large. So a strategy that we can do to deal with fatalism is to highlight role models and success stories. This is really important because when we share stories that empower, it connects with people's emotions again. And it shows people that solutions are possible and doable. And so this group, Momentum for Change, Lighthouse Activities, is great because they highlight every year the most innovative solutions, transformative climate solutions from around the world. And they have an interactive map that you can look at online if anyone's interested. And then they recognize these groups at the UN Climate Conference each year. And so it's just a really great way to show people that solutions are possible, they're happening, and they're happening around the world. Another way for us to combat this fatalism is for us to acknowledge and praise leaders that are making bold moves. This is a quote from Governor Jerry Brown, it's time for courage, it's time for creativity, it's time for boldness to tackle climate change. It's really easy for us to focus on the leaders that are not responding to climate change and focus on the negative because there are a lot that aren't and because that's what the media focuses on. The media really focuses on the negative stories. And so it's really important for us to applaud and acknowledge the leaders that are trying because it gives us hope and sends the message that this is an important issue that leaders are taking action on. What we um, also can do is involve the community. What we, as I mentioned before, what we need with climate change is a broad movement, diverse movement across um, all different spheres. We need the public engaged, we need politicians engaged, we need business owners engaged, we need people in the social scientists, artists, scientists, we need a lot of different people engaged. And we need to engage our indigenous communities and indigenous knowledge um, because that's what the solutions call for with climate change. And so this is a great way when looking at solutions if we can engage the whole community um, it's a way that allow people to feel empowered and also we're gonna ultimately come up with stronger solutions if we're gonna if we can get as many people involved in this dialogue around climate change as possible. What we also saw, if you can remember, is this um, barrier of having parallel narratives of loss versus solutions. So we have the narrative of loss, which feels apocalyptic and devastating, and the narrative of solution, which doesn't match up with the narrative of loss. And so what we can do is we can encourage realism, which um, may seem like a challenge, but it's really important and it goes into that acknowledging loss and grief segment that I talked about before. We can provide realistic timescales, choices, and options for people around climate change. So when we're talking about solutions, we have to acknowledge the loss involved and then come up with realistic timeframes and choices. We have to discuss openly the loss I suggested and then normalize choosing loss and working through the motions involved. So normalize, normalizing basically um, our lifestyle will have to change as individuals and society and we have to normalize that choice to um, we're not going to have be able to have all the comforts that we've had in the present, and we're going to have to be okay with choosing that for the greater good of our planet and ourselves, ultimately. So what I talked about with sense of place was the barrier of the not me, not here, not now phenomena. So we never think that climate change is going to affect us personally in our home. And so what we can do as a strategy for this is to use place-based impact communication. This photo here is an example of a success story with this strategy. This is a group called Protect Our Winters, and their mission is to engage and mobilize the snow sports community to lead a fight on climate change. And this is, has been really impactful because it's a good example because not everyone within the snow sports community believes in climate change or has the same views around climate change, but they've been able to have a successful mobilization 
around a sense of place, lifestyle, and community. Another example is to um, focus on place-based education for kids in schools. And so this is an example that I, um, a project I did last year where I worked with the Coastal Ecosystem Institute of Northern California and the city of Arcata to develop regional climate change curriculum for sixth grade science here on Humboldt Bay. And if you're interested in learning more, it's all hosted on the website listed here and it's downloadable free of charge. This is just an example that there are already um, programs or projects in place and starting here in Humboldt County, we have education for students that is place-based, focused on climate change in our community. And the last influence that I talked about was how people respond to risk and value of certainty, which I'll remind you is that, is that we'd rather make a small risk go to zero than a large risk go down slightly, which is very hard when dealing with climate change because we have a lot of variability. So there's a couple strategies for this and um, focusing on tapping uncertainty. So we can emphasize the human and financial cost of an action, and that's what this chart shows. Uh, it shows on the right with climate action if we prepare now, instead of waiting until we have climate change related disasters, we'll actually be saving money. So this is again going on the common values of preparedness. Um, and so you can really highlight this. And as, we, as I mentioned before, voters really are in favor of preparedness. So you can tap uncertainty and make it a strategy and a solution. What you can also do is promote practical strategies that offer multiple benefits. So this is an example with energy efficiency improvement. You see that it also creates job creation, health and social benefits, public budget. So you can engage with someone around climate change that maybe, even if they don't believe in climate change or energy efficiency, you can say, well, these are all the other benefits. So maybe they'll Want, want it for job creation or energy prices. So if you can show people that there's a lot of other added benefits or solutions around climate change, then you can also get more people engaged. So I, in conclusion, I just, I liked this quote, stuff between not caring at all and caring too much because I think it's kind of the conundrum that we kind of see around public engagement with climate change. We see people that seem apathetic to it or if people care so much that they're paralyzed. And so I just wanted to reiterate that to successfully relate to people, we have to realize that there's a lot of psychological factors that influence an individual's response to climate change. And it's not that people don't care. In fact, many people care deeply. It's just that they're paralyzed with not knowing what to do. And so what I believe we need to start with is we need to open lines of communication and communicate from a place of compassion and find that which we can connect on and what we can move from there because I think that in order to create a broad public engagement piece around climate change, we need to first start a dialogue. And I want to again reiterate the fact that you don't need to come from the same ideology or have the same worldview as someone. In fact, we need a diverse movement with as many people involved with different backgrounds as possible. What we do need to be able to do is to work together to find solutions. So we really need to be able to find out how to communicate with people. So again, the issue in my mind is that it's much less about people denying climate change exists, but it's more about us being able to communicate with each other and help move people to, towards different stages of acceptance <coughs> and um, figuring out how we can meet people where they're at and include as many people as possible in the movement. So I just, I thought that since we are close to the holidays, I wanted to suggest that you all, um, encourage you all to start a dialogue with someone about climate change and really listen to where they're coming from and see how it makes you feel. And um, because we really are almost together and we need to be able to start that dialogue on a community level. Thank you very much.